Okay, good morning and welcome to the second invited presentation at Crypto. Professor Felton is the Robert E. Kahn Professor of Computer Science and Public Affairs at Princeton University. He's also Director of the Center for Information Technology Policy, a group dedicated to studying digital technologies in public life. Ed's wide-ranging career provides an exceptional bridge between academia, industry, and government policy. Uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Felton to Crypto 2015. Thanks. Uh, well, let me start off by talking a little bit about um, my background and the position that I'm in right now to give you a little bit of context on the talk. Um, my current position is uh, Deputy U.S. Chief Technology Officer at the White House. Um, I work in, uh, this is a view from our office suite um, in the CTO's office. Um, our office basically, uh, our job is to be the primary advisors to the president and his senior advisors on issues of technology policy. Uh, really across the whole spectrum of technology policy, and that includes issues that are of particular interest to this, uh, to this community. Uh, I've been there about two months. Uh, before that, I spent about 20 years, 20 years plus, as a professor at Princeton, uh, first in computer science, and then for the last 10 years of that or so, also in public policy. Um, and within computer science, the bulk of my work has been in security and privacy, although more from a systems standpoint than, from a crypt than crypto. I had had a few forays into the applied crypto literature. Um, um, I also took a break during that time to spend a year and a half at the Federal Trade Commission as their first chief technologist. Um, the FTC uh, is in charge of consumer protection and also does competition policy within the U.S. government. So in my current position at the White House, the White House is an organization that obviously has a much broader scope of work um, there. So I do security and privacy. You may have seen me at this conference once or twice before. So what I'd like to talk about today is um, what are the uh, public policy issues before the U.S. government that relate to encryption? Now, of course, there is one issue that you probably want to hear about most, and trust me, I'll get around to that. But before I do that, I, I want to spend some time talking about the broad range of, of, of topics, which um, I think may surprise you a little bit um, how often crypto comes up in talking about um, policy issues. The role of the U.S. government with respect to cryptography is, um, uh, is really very multifaceted. Um, the government is a user of, of, of cryptography um, in building services and in its own internal operations. It's a buyer. Uh, U.S. government buys a lot of crypto-related products. It's a regulator, meaning that uh, the government regulates a lot of businesses that do things that might relate to crypto. For example, when I was at the FTC, we dealt with issues about what companies did to protect sensitive um, consumer data that they were holding. Um, and in some cases, we were asking uh, whether there might be an obligation of companies to apply encryption in certain settings to protect data. And so as a regulator, the government sometimes um, insists on people using crypto in certain ways. The government is a technology developer. Um, you, you might think of the government as developing defense or national security related technology, which it often does. Uh, but government develops a lot of other technologies for things, for more mundane um, tasks like time tracking and uh, not to mention about 1,200 different websites um, that range in complexity from very simple to something very complex like the, uh, uh, like the healthcare.gov website that you might have heard about. Um, government is a system administrator, runs a very large number of systems. Um, Government, of course, does, uh, the U.S. government does uh, a large amount of research through national labs and other kinds of organizations, and of course, funds a lot more research. Many of you probably have or have had U.S. government research funding. A government is a standard writer, um, uh, mostly through the work of NIST, and I'll come back to this issue. And government is also an analyst, trying to understand uh, the strengths and weaknesses of different kinds of approaches in order to make decisions about what the government itself should do. So it's a very multifaceted um, uh, involvement with crypto in, um, that, that the U.S. government does. So I want to sort of walk through a bunch of policy issues related to crypto, and let me start with this one. Um, one current theme of policy is 
the effort to deploy crypto across the US government and its technologies. This is a memo from the federal CIO, Tony Scott, uh, from, from just a couple months ago, uh, which requires all publicly accessible federal websites and web services to only provide service through a secure connection. In other words, all federal websites will be HTTPS only once this is implemented. And if you go into page two of this memo, what you see is this particular bullet that says that agencies must make all existing websites and services accessible through a secure connection, that is HTTPS only, with HSTS, which is a standard that is designed to prevent protocol downgrade attacks so that a man in the middle cannot trick a user's browser into believing that the website is offered insecurely. Um, and that has to happen by December 31st, 2016 for all existing websites. Uh, for, all, uh, for all existing websites and services. New sites and services have earlier deadlines. Um, and uh, the government has done not only this order to its own agencies with respect to its websites, but also has produced a very nice implementation guide and playbook that helps agencies actually roll these things out that was written by engineers at a group called 18F, which is kind of the uh, open source uh, software development um, arm of the government. Uh, we have this nice website, pulse.cio.gov. That's, of course, HTTPS, pulse.cio.gov, uh, which, uh, which will show you how we're doing against this goal. Uh, when I took this screenshot, which was a few weeks ago, 29% uh, of federal websites used HTTPS. And on the right side, it talks about how many uh, support um, analytics that are accessible to the public. So we have this dashboard. And you can click through on the bottom here and get information about uh, the status of all the different federal websites. There are about 1,200 uh, federal government websites in all. So here you can see, for example, that whitehouse.gov does use HTTPS only with HSTS enabled and a preloaded cert. So we get an A on the SSL Labs test, which is a fairly stringent test of, um, of uh, HTTPS best practices. Um, you can click on the A and you get all of the details in excruciating detail. You can see, for example, that our website, the White House website, provides forward secrecy for modern browsers. For older browsers, uh, forward secrecy um, is, uh, is really not possible. So we get an A rather than A plus because one of our intermediate certs uses SHA-1 instead of a stronger hash function. So you can see all across the government who's doing how and what we uh, hope and expect and what in fact has been ordered is that these um, lines will fill in with more and more uh, implementations as we approach that date uh, at the end of 2016. OK, so that's crypto deployment internally. Another thing that we're looking at is deployment of encryption uh, for, uh, for stronger authentication. We want to move beyond the password, right? We've known for a long time, everyone has known for a long time, that passwords are not the best way of authenticating people. Passwords are not very secure. Their human factors are not good. Um, and we've known that for a long time. And we've known that there are cryptographically better ways of doing it. Um, but actually getting those deployed at scale across a large organization or across the entire online ecosystem has really been a challenge for just about everybody. Uh, and so one of the policy areas that we're looking at is what we can do about this what we as a government can do about this. And for the US government, there are really three scenarios to consider that I'm pointing at here. Uh, the first scenario is an employee or contractor, someone who works for the government, who needs to authenticate themselves to a government service of some kind. Um, and for this, we have a system that is based on a bunch of NIST, NIST standards um, that, um, in which people get an employee ID card that's called the PIV card, Personal Identity Verification, I think that stands for. The Department of Defense calls it a CAC, Common Access Credential. It's the same thing. It's this smart card that is your employee ID, which you can use to authenticate in various ways. Um, so uh, the second case is the public authenticating to government sites. And here there's an existing uh, initiative called connect.gov. Uh, this is a diagram from connect.gov. The idea is that you, the users can get um, credentials from a bunch of private sector uh, credential providers, and uh, they can use those to authenticate to uh, the connect.gov service, and the connect.gov service uh, provides a single sign-on, which can be used across some uh, federal sites. 
Uh, and so the plan is to build this out into something which is, has been, the plan has been to build this out into something that has broader deployments with more possible source, approved sources of credentials in the private sector and more government websites able to use this so that when an American or an overseas person who wants to get, for example, a visa is going to engage in repeated interactions with the government site, that we have a better way of authenticating them. The third piece is the most difficult, and this from a from a policy standpoint, and this is the case of authentication of anybody to, uh, to any service. And we would like to do what we can in the government not to impose a solution on people, but to try to be a catalyst for the development and deployment of something that's better than what we currently have in a lot of settings. And so there's this effort called the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace. I'm not gonna go into this in a lot of detail, but what um, and this NSTIC um, effort has been trying to do is to try to be a catalyst for, uh, for broader deployment of, of, um, of authentication. And we'd, uh, to put it bluntly, we'd like that to go faster. But this is an area, again, in which government, we believe, has something to contribute to trying to be a catalyst for the emergence of a better, uh, of a better crypto ecosystem for regular people in practice. Now here's an example, um, this, this photo is an example of an important change that's happening right now in the US government that relates to deployment of, of, of crypto. And that is the arrival of serious technologists across government. For a long time, uh, th this comes from Fast Company Magazine. Um, for a long time, uh, there has been technical expertise in government, but within what you might call the science agencies, within agencies that have a particular connection to or a particular history or mission that relates to technology. And you can, you know, you can, you can make a list of those. Uh, what's changing now is that we're seeing um, technologists move into government really across the whole spectrum of the government beyond those few technology-focused agencies. Uh, this photo shows most of the tech workforce that's working within the White House organization. These people are serious engineers, user experience designers. Some of them have been founders and uh, senior engineering leaders in, uh, in companies that you've heard of. They're now working for the government and they are building, um, uh, and they are building technologies that, are, uh, uh, that, that can actually serve public needs in, in a better way than, than before. This is what grew out of the government's response to the healthcare.gov website rollout, which you might have heard didn't go so well at first, um, but was fixed by a bunch of, by some of these people coming in and, um, uh, and applying um, better engineering practice to, uh, to the problem. Uh, so there's, a, there's been a serious effort to deploy serious engineering talent across the government, and these are uh, 130 people who have come to, uh, to do that. So these are not people who update windows on your desktop. These are people who build and design serious systems. Um, and I want to point you, I just want to refer to, oh, and this is unfortunately, um, uh, you can barely see him over here on the left. Um, Mikey Dickerson is, uh, is one of the heroes of this effort. Um, and he gave this talk at South by Southwest, Why We Need You in the Government, which I just want to refer to. Um, he basically talks about waking up one day and saying, um, I'm spending my professional life um, making it so that uh, some pile of dollars goes to billionaire A rather than billionaire B. I would prefer to spend my days um, trying to solve important public problems of which technology is part of the solution. And he talks about sort of finding a mission to work in government to try to actually solve these problems. Um, and um, I would just urge you, if um, you're interested in, in why people do this, why serious engineers go to work for the government, to, uh, to watch the YouTube video of Mikey's talk at South by Southwest. All right. Another role for government is as a standard writer. This is DES, the first uh, NIST crypto standard. Um, this document is dated um, January 1977, uh, the very first version. Back then, NIST, of course, was called the National Bureau of Standards. There was, of course, a bunch of drama around the design of DES. There was a discussion of the key size and why it was only 56 bits, um, but probably more drama over the design of the S boxes, which was initially secret. Um, and that led to a lot of suspicion about what the secret was. Um, we later learned, of course, that the secret was that DES was designed to be resistant against a kind of cryptanalysis which wasn't publicly known yet. So DES turned out to be as strong as it appeared to be um, at the end of the day. Here we have AES. AES, of course, was the successor to DES. 
This was chosen um, by NIST again after an extensive and public competition process. AES um, has the stature it has now among symmetric ciphers, partly because of its design, but frankly partly because of the open and transparent process that led to it. Um, this is one of the big successes of government policy with respect to crypto standards, is the design of AES. And of course, just a couple weeks ago, um, NIST issued uh, the SHA-3 standard, a new hash function and some related functionality. Again, the result of an extensive public discussion and debate. So clearly, um, the government, NIST, knows how to design um, crypto standards that, um, that can get extensive buy-in from the, the community. Uh, and then there's this thing. You might have heard about the dual EC DRBG standard. And in case you haven't heard, um, for the two people who haven't heard about this, this was one option in a NIST standard for generating pseudo-random bits. Um, P and Q down here at the bottom are are um, public parameters, they are points in an elliptic curve. Um, and if P and Q are chosen in a random and independent way, then as far as we know, the algorithm seems to be secure with one caveat that um, I'm not going to go into here. Uh, but a party who can choose P and Q themselves can choose a P and Q that will look random to observers, but which allow the party who made that choice to defeat the generator. All right, so who chose P and Q? Um, and how do we know that they didn't choose it in a way that uh, leaves a back door? Uh, well, we can dig into this a little bit more. Oh. <laughs> Maybe not. Um, all right. So <laughs> NIST did a really admirable postmortem on this. Um, NIST convened an expert panel as part of that postmortem, and um, I, I was. Um, I served on that panel before I joined the government, along with some people who frankly know a lot more about crypto than I do, um, including Bart Preneal and Ron Rivest. Um, and um, that was part of NIST's process of figuring out what had happened in this case and, um, uh, and, and what NIST should be doing going forward. So was this a deliberately inserted backdoor? Um, I'll let you reach your own conclusions based on the evidence, and I think I can guess where most of you will come down on that question. Um, I, I was convinced before I joined the government, and I haven't seen anything to contradict this, that NIST was trying to make a strong standard. But by NIST's own admission, um, as part of this postmortem, NIST did not do enough to create a standard that the public could trust as being backdoor free. In other words, the question to be asking here is not, is there a backdoor? But the question that NIST should have been striving to answer is, how can we convince people that there's not a backdoor? How can we get that public confidence? Um, and this is a case where NIST, by its own admission, uh, didn't uh, do enough. And NIST's process has led to uh, changes in the way it does its, uh, its encryption um, standardization. NIST reissued the standard with dual EC removed. Um, and more importantly, it rethought its procedures for standard setting to try to get the necessary trust in the future. Now, that trust can't be rebuilt overnight. But I'm convinced that NIST is, is doing what it can to create new standards in ways that we can trust. And NIST really, I think, has an indispensable role to play in crypto standards. There are different sources for crypto standards, and they have their pros and cons from a public standpoint. But I think NIST's role is one that is uh, difficult to replace with any other standard maker. Cryptography is also a free trade issue. We'd like to avoid a world where every country has its own crypto standards, and we can't communicate securely across borders because of incompatibility. So we want people to be able to choose which crypto algorithms they're going to use. Of course, every government can choose which crypto it wants to use for its own communications. On the White House website, we're a little bit picky about which crypto we use. We don't use RC4 or MD5. Uh, we prefer AES and SHA-256. Um, and, um, but um, interoperation and uh, a set of crypto standards that work internationally are an important goal, and they're one of the things that we strive for when we think about uh, trade policy. So as you can see, there are lots of policy issues that touch crypto, but these days there's the one issue that gets most of the attention, so let me talk about that. Uh, let me start by, uh, by uh, quoting from James Comey, the director of the FBI. Um, and he's talked about th what the FBI calls the going dark problem that people are switching to crypto that gives users exclusive control over the access to data, 
that is um, both in cases of encrypted storage and encrypted communications, which in many technical respects are, uh, are different scenarios. And uh, this trend reduces law enforcement's ability to get data in certain cases from a technology provider, even in response to a valid warrant or a court order. Director Comey's spoken pretty forcefully about this, and the NSA director, Admiral Mike Rogers, has talked about the impact on foreign intelligence of these trends in, in crypto. And this has brought the issue of encryption policy back into the spotlight. I want to take some time to talk about this issue and where we are on it. And the first thing I want to say is that this um, argument about going dark is the opinion and position of the FBI, but it's not, it's not necessarily the opinion and position of the U.S. government as a whole. Um, if you want to understand what the position of the government is, uh, the first person to listen to is this guy, the boss. Um, we always look to the boss for guidance, and here's what he had to say in an interview back in February. He starts out by saying, we all want to know that if we're using a smartphone for transactions or sending messages, et cetera, we don't want to have a bunch of people compromising that. So there's no scenario in which we don't want really strong encryption. Where there's a situation where there's a specific case, a possible national security threat, is there a way of accessing it? If not, then we're really going to have to have a public debate. So I'm in Silicon Valley, and probably a lot of people in this room would argue that the harms done by having any kind of compromised encryption are far greater. And then um, he acknowledges this and says, this is a public conversation we should end up having. I lean probably further in the direction of strong encryption than some do inside of law enforcement, but I'm sympathetic to law enforcement because I know the kind of pressure they're under to keep us safe. So the president here is acknowledging that strong crypto is important and that we shouldn't lightly dismiss the a desire for strong crypto. But we also shouldn't lightly dismiss the, uh, uh, the, the job that law enforcement is tasked to do in protecting us. Um, in other words, um, so the president recognizes that, and those of us who work on this issue day to day inside the government see it the same way. There are some important equities at stake, and it's really important to get the policy right. Okay, so what is the state of, of US government policy right now? Here's the current state of play within the administration. There are extensive internal discussions going on about the issues, about the facts, and about what we should do as a result of, uh, of what we know. We've been talking to as many stakeholders as we can. That includes companies, that includes civil society groups, that includes experts. Um, some of you in this room have come in and talked to me, have talked to my colleagues, have talked to my colleagues in the White House, in law enforcement, and, and elsewhere in the government. Um, and we appreciate the input and the information that we get from doing that. Uh, we'd like to get to a decision about the administration policy sooner rather than later because we recognize that it's not ideal to have uncertainty about what our position is going to be. Uh, but we also recognize that we want to end up adopting the right policy and to be in a position to execute that policy successfully when we do decide it. So an issue this complex can't be resolved overnight, but we do recognize the importance of getting to a decision um, as quickly as we reasonably can. Okay, so how do we, how do we actually make decisions like this? Um, well, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to talk about our internal process and where we are specifically on this specific issue. So let me talk in general about how the administration, about how this White House decides issues like this. Um, and here's a rough um, algorithm for doing it. Uh, we, we talk about identifying the issue. We identify the equities at stake. Equities are anything that government is legitimately trying to optimize or obtain. Any, any good thing that, that it's government's job to cause to happen or bad thing that it's government's job to prevent, uh, that is an equity. We identify the equities. We consult with stakeholders. We consult internally. Uh, it is generally a mistake to think of the government as a unitary entity. Government is made up of many different offices and branches and departments. Each one has its own mission, and each one tends to see the equities that are closely related to its own mission um, the most clearly um, and, tends to, um, uh, and tends to argue um, based on the equities related to its own mission. Um, but it's the job of the government to work across this organization to come to a policy that can be uh, decided in a uniform way. So 
Um, we consult with stakeholders, consult internally, identify what are the policy options, what choices can be made, how would each option affect the equities, and then we frame the decision for senior decision makers. Here are the reasonable, here are the best options, here are the trade-offs between them, this is how the equity would, equities would be affected if you do A versus B. Um, and then we'll go to senior decision makers and say Here, here's where we are. They might say, great, I choose A, I choose B, I choose C, or they might say, well, we need more information about this, such and such part of your uh, analysis isn't complete enough, go back and do it again. Um, eventually a decision is made and we then explain that decision to the public and to internal stakeholders. This is roughly how we go about making, the decision, making, making decisions about important issues. All right, so when we talk about encryption and we talk about this issue of the going dark problem or the backdoor issue, um, uh, there are several equities that are relevant. Um, we start by enumerating the equities. Um, in this case, here are four of the equities that would be affected by a decision about, uh, about encryption policy. The first one is public safety, um, and that is the ability of law enforcement and the intelligence community to get information that they're entitled to get when they have a court order in order to protect the public. This has to do with, uh, this has to do with um, gathering evidence, it has to do with um, prosecuting crime and so on, uh, which is an important equity. And it's something which law enforcement is, in many cases at least, um, allowed to do under our legal system. Of course, subject to the rule of law. Second is, well, I'm not going to say the C word, I do work for the government and I might say it internally, let me just say security here. Um, that is the need to prevent and deter attacks. Um, uh, there's a lot of discussion about what the implications, uh, what the risk would be that would be brought on um, by, um, uh, by some kind of uh, encryption mandate, and uh, that's something that we take into account. Uh, to the extent that a policy would increase the risk of an attack, make it more difficult to respond to an attack, uh, that's something that we will take into account as one of the equities. The third, equity is, uh, the, the third equity here is economic competitiveness and generally economic development. That has to do with the ability of technology providers to compete for usage globally. Having a global competitive market for uh, encryption and security related products is we think a good thing. Uh, we think it's good for American companies to be able to sell overseas. And we think generally having, a, um, having products that can work together across borders is a good thing and anything that undermines that um, is, uh, uh, is a negative. Um, and then last on the list, but not, uh, but not necessarily the least important, is civil liberties and human rights. And that is protecting people around the world from abuses of power by governments and by others. Um, we recognize that the actions, the decisions made by the US government have international implications. That the decision that the US government makes, the position that it takes, um, may embolden other countries to take similar actions, uh, whatever it is that we do, um, and that therefore that the decisions that we make are, are, are going to have international implications, and we need to take that into account, and we need to think about the implications of what we're doing for civil liberties and human rights around the world. So these are the equities, and um, generally, um, if one is deciding between alternatives, one will look at how those alternatives affect the equities, and then do a kind of weighing. To the extent that the equities are incomparable by nature, that's a matter for senior decision makers to deal with. Okay. One question people often ask us is, um, uh, is, is to what extent are we taking uh, technical factors into account in our discussion? We haven't talked, I think it's fair to say, we haven't talked in public about specific uh, technical analysis or technical approaches and trade-offs. Um, and I know this has led some people to jump to the conclusion that the government, U.S. government, is not thinking about the technical issues around this encryption decision. That's not correct. Let me assure you that we are thinking and talking about the technical issues as part of our internal discussion. Um, and of course it's useful and helpful to the process if the crypto community, in other words you, talk about the technical details of these questions and the technical trade-offs that, that they open to talk about it publicly and to talk about it with us. There are probably interesting and challenging research questions here, um, as well as applications of existing knowledge. And we're always happy to hear from people in the community and to hear new ideas. 
My email address was on the initial slide. It will be on the slide that's up during the Q&A. And I want to invite you to, uh, uh, to contact me about this. Um, Here's a little peek into the technical discussion um, that we've had internally. This is an actual diagram used in our internal discussions. Um, this is drawn by me, an Alice and Bob diagram um, that comes from um, about minute five of a one hour briefing and discussion um, that I've done with um, senior people in the government. Um, of course, no crypto discussion would be complete without Alice and Bob. Um, so this is from uh, this, excuse me. Um, uh, this gives some background about how encrypted communication often works with public key crypto. Here you have Alice and Bob at the top. They start out with, a, with what I'm calling here a long-term identity key. Um, they engage in an initial handshake protocol which, in which each authenticates the other and they negotiate a session key. And then later down here they use the session key in phase two to transfer data uh, between themselves by symmetric encryption. Right, so this is a description of how, um, of how uh, encrypted communication works, and it, as I said, this is from minute five of a much longer discussion. This gives you a little window into uh, how our discussions uh, tend to go. Encrypted storage, of course, is a different scenario, um, and one that uh, has a different Alice and Bob diagram. Okay, so where are we going to go on this issue? Uh, we honestly don't know yet, and I don't want to get ahead of the policy process by uh, trying to predict um, where we're going to go. Um, but there are two things I can say um, that I think have emerged pretty clearly from the public discussion that's happened so far. The first one is that uh, nobody wants to do the clipper chip again. Nobody is proposing a requirement that everyone has to use the same specific algorithm or the specific, same specific government mandated technical approach. Those who do support a mandate of some sort would be mandating a capability and leaving implementers uh, some freedom to decide how to achieve that capability. And that, of course, makes sense. If you're going to go in the direction of having a mandate, and again, I emphasize, some people are advocating that within the government. It's not a decision that has been made by any means. But if one were to go in this direction, um, giving implementers um, some freedom to decide exactly how to do it for their particular product makes some sense. Now, saying that, that, that that uh, mandate advocates would give implementers some discretion um, does not exempt us from the need to think hard about what are the technical options and what are the technical trade-offs that implementers would face. Because the decision, the policy decision that needs to be made does depend on the real options that real implementers would have and the real trade-offs they would have to face. So we don't get out of the ability to talk about and consider the, the, the real technical trade-offs by just saying, don't worry, you guys can work it out. Proponents want, the proponents of a mandate want implementers to have, to have freedom to, as to how to do this. To be absolutely clear, that's not a thing we've decided to do. Have I said that enough times? Thanks. Um, right, and I wanna make one last point about lawful access before we uh, open it up to Q&A and discussion. What law enforcement is asking for, what they would like to get, and what, they, uh, and what they need to do their job as effectively as possible, is to be able to get access to data when they have a valid warrant. Um, encryption, uh, they argue, can be a barrier to that access, and it's hard to argue that certain kinds of encryption can be a barrier to law enforcement getting access. But other factors can be barriers too. And if we want to talk about what can be done technologically to help law enforcement protect us, uh, we can talk about other ways of lowering those other barriers. For example, when law enforcement shows up with a warrant at a company with a warrant for data, and the company does have that data, how quickly can the data be delivered? Of course, the company will want their lawyers to look over the warrant to make sure the warrant is good. But after that, if the warrant is valid and the rule of law has been followed and the company does have the data, how quickly can the data be delivered? And how well can the company separate the data that is responsive to the warrant from the data that is just nearby and that law enforcement doesn't uh, have any legitimate desire to get? Um, by doing a better job at those things, companies can help law enforcement do their job, but without requiring the kind of changes to crypto that um, um, that, that are being talked about in the other discussion. 
So my point is companies can be more helpful to legitimate law enforcement needs, and they can do more to protect their users and the public from harm, even if they don't change their crypto. Um, and, um, and to the extent that it's possible to do that with lower security risk, um, that is a thing that I think companies should think about doing. All right, so this is a hard problem. But if we want to end up in the right place, um, I suggest that maybe we should take a cue from this guy and chill out a bit. So we need to figure out what's possible and what's not possible. We need to figure out, actually, what are the options and what are the trade-offs for reconciling um, two things that are both important, which is the legitimate need for law enforcement to be able to enforce the law and catch dangerous people who do exist while protecting everybody else um, from, uh, from security risk, from risk to civil liberties and uh, human rights, uh, and from the economic impact of some of the policies that have been suggested. The fact is that we can't have everything that we want. We can't achieve all of those equities perfectly, and there's no solution that gets us there. So we're going to have, so the decision will involve making trade-offs, and that's exactly the reason that we need to have a rational conversation. Um, so finally, I want to remind you that there's a lot more for government to do on security besides this one issue. Um, we can always use more smart people helping out both inside and outside of government at solving genuinely hard social problems. There are a lot of things that all of us uh, or that all reasonable people agree should be happening that are not happening in the world or things that are happening that we can agree should not, uh, we would like to prevent. Um, and I don't want this one issue to become a barrier to working together on those things where we do agree uh, across the board on what should be happening. Uh, we can always use more help inside of government, and we can always use more people outside of government uh, working to make good things happen, uh, even if we disagree on some things. So thanks for your time. Um, I've left um, a good chunk of time for conversation, and I look forward to conversation in the Q&A now and afterwards. Thanks.